Okay, so infants own activities uh, create and actively select their own learning experiences. And so in the talk today, I will try to um, review some recent models of uh, embodied um, active learning that we could also call uh, embodied curiosity-driven learning and try to argue that these mechanisms uh, have maybe deep implications for development and also for evolution. So the argument I'm going to uh, develop is uh, one that I um, uh, made in collaboration with Linda Smith and is discussing a, a number of models that have been developed with a, a, a pretty large number of colleagues which names you will see uh, across the slides. So first I will uh, discuss how mechanisms of active learning or curiosity-driven learning uh, can contribute to the self-organization of ordered behavioral and cognitive uh, um, stages in development. So learning experiences do not passively happen to infants. Uh, infants' own activities create those, exp those learning experiences as I was just saying. And so Piaget talked about this a lot and for example he, he used to take the example of an infant uh, playing with a rattle and so as the infant is moving with the rattle it comes into sight, it is making noise, arousing, <coughs> agitating the infant and then causing more body motion thus causing the rattle to move again again out of sight, inside sight, making more noise. And the infant at the beginning has no prior knowledge uh, of the rattle uh, if he did never played with it but he discovers through this activity the task and the, the goal of this rattle shaking. As he accidentally moves the, the rattle, he sees and he hears the consequences and then he gets captured by the activity as he sees those contingencies and incrementally uh, he repeats again those uh, actions gaining intentional control over the rattle and making noise with it for example. And activities uh, such as this form of uh, rattle exploration uh, can be seen as instances of action and learning motivated by curiosity or at least partially motivated by curiosity. And so they may reflect brain mechanisms of uh, what psychologists have been calling intrinsic motivation that select sensory motor activities which are interesting. Um, what is interesting is also history dependent. Uh, once, for example, all the variations in the rattle shaking are easily predicted by the child and he expects all the outcomes, then it's not interesting anymore to play with the rattle. Um, and so there is one very important um, idea that has been explored uh, many times in psychology uh, in, in the last 50 years, which is that maybe what's interesting in many situations is um, neither what is well known nor what is too complex but what is just beyond current knowledge um, what is of intermediate complexity as we just discussed in some of the recent talks and which has been for example instantiated into the concept of cognitive dissonance for example by Kagan uh, optimal incongruity, intermediate novelty or more recently optimal challenge by Chicks and Mihai. But beyond this, this work in psychology, uh, there has been a number of um, advances in several fields uh, recently. Some of them were made uh, in the field of development of robotics. Some other were made uh, in the modeling of the evolutionary origins of intrinsic motivation. So for example, there is recent work by the group of Andrew Barto about that. Um, uh, there is other recent work in neuroscience linking uh, intrinsic motivation and attention. Uh, and um, as the previous talk and probably the, the, the talk of Celeste later on, there is uh, uh, data uh, in infant uh, uh, behavior which is also uh, s exploring these ideas. And so in general learning in these curiosity driven uh, uh, activities progresses uh, to yield improvement of prediction or improvement of their control uh, over a repeated activity and thus a reduction of uncertainty. And those situations where there is a reduction of uncertainty or a learning experience or a learning progress is some something that we've been used to call a progress niche, progress niches. And 
basically it's been suggested that this learning progress in and for itself could generate an intrinsic reward which an action selection system directly aims to maximize for example within a reinforcement learning framework and this could be used to be an important driver of spontaneous exploration so really here progress in prediction or progress in control could be a primary driver not a secondary driver a primary driver in the sense that it, th there might be some kind of of, of uh, primary rewards in the brain that would really uh, reward learning progress or uncertainty reduction and basically this idea leads to a, a potential definition of curiosity as uh, an epistemic motivational mechanism which basically pushes an organism to explore some activities for the primary sake of uh, gaining information as opposed to searching for information in the service of an external goal like finding food or shelter which doesn't mean by the way that those primary rewards uh, for searching for information uh, were not evolutionary selected for the distal goal of uh, allowing the agent to build a good model of the world and then to find better food and better reproduction in the future we are here speaking about proximal mechanisms and so from a machine learning perspective I won't talk a lot of, uh, of that today uh, tomorrow I think Manuel will outline um, uh, the machine learning perspective of these of, of these ideas but those mechanisms of information seeking they are called active learning and which is really when you have a learner which probabilistic sel selects the learning experiences um, according to their potential for reducing uncertainty and and with the goal of acceler accelerating the learning and and so in those approaches you can have them uh, in a pretty classical reinforcement learning framework where there is an external goal and then you can see those um, uh, uh, those things as some kind of exploration bonus as we saw this morning <coughs> or you can see them as a primary reward that is pure in itself and that drives uh, for example the acquisition of sensory motor models um, but it is important to keep in mind that such a motivational mechanism uh, of curiosity is only one of several other motivational systems which are operated, operating in uh, any living being and at any time in a real living organism curiosity may interact in a complicated manner and sometimes complement, sometimes conflict with other forms of motivations so for example motivation for food uh, motivation for uh, the mechanisms for preserving the, the physical integrity and a very important one it, which is uh, motivation for forming social bonds and then this relates also to a whole other uh, uh, sub-universe about the learning mechanism which is that of social learning and then you still have um, all the forms of mechanisms that are also uh, constraining the, the exploration um, in infants in particular is things like maturation, the fact that the body is growing, there are new degrees of freedom that uh, are liberated with time, the sensory apparatus is also developing and this is also influencing uh, exploration. And so basically uh, in what follows I will mostly focus on studying and discussing the impact of those mechanisms of exploration driven by curiosity but it's important to keep in mind that uh, there is no claim in any way at all here to, 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 to say that there is one hypothesis that it would be the full story I mean interaction with these other mechanisms are paramount and they are actually the topic of other research other modeling in our team outside our team and uh, we can discuss about that uh, after the talk if you're interested Okay, so now I will outline a, a, a robotic model, model that illustrates these ideas and uh, basically illustrating how an active search for learning progress can lead uh, a system to first explore simple activities and then progressively, progressively shift to more complex learning experiencing, experiences and thus self-organizing a learning curriculum which is basically at any point quite adapted to the current constraints of the learning system and which is at the same time constraining learning and shaping the, lear the developmental trajectory so the playground experiments illustrate uh, uh, such mechanisms of curiosity driven exploration where uh, 
they, those mechanisms are dynamically interacting with um, statistical inference mechanisms, uh, physical constraints, but also some social, very simplified but st still social constraints. In, in the, I will explain soon. And basically exploring how it can self-organize those developmental trajectories, and as I will soon explain, how it can allow an organism to go from the exploration of low-level sensory motor uh, skills to uh, exploring vocal interaction with a social peer. So in this experiment, you've basically one uh, uh, quadruped robot, which is this one at the center, which is the, the learning robot, uh, and around him are a number of objects he can potentially interact with or not interact with. So for example, you have some little object here that, that he can learn to push with its leg, some little object that he can be able to grasp in various ways with its mouth, some uh, robot which is here, which is pre-programmed, it's a kind of very simplified adult social peer, which is basically imitating the vocalization of this one when this one is vocalizing and looking at this one. And you have also other objects around, but which are basically, for example, too far for this robot to interact with. So this robot uh, is yet, uh, uh, cannot move around. I mean, his legs uh, are, are blocked, the back legs, the back legs. Um, and the learning robot is basically equipped with a number of um, motor and sensory primitives. Each primitive, each motor primitive, is typically um, a dynamical system which is going to control various kinds of actions. And basically, it's some kind of black box in which you enter some numbers, so the robot enters some numbers, and it's going to produce a complex movement which is related to turning the head in various directions, or also opening and closing the mouth, or vocalizing with uh, various fundamental frequency or various lengths, uh, crouching with various strength and timing, and rocking the leg in various angles and various speeds. And so the robot has also sensory primitives, such as primitives for detecting uh, visual movements, uh, detecting uh, uh, like uh, building uh, vi salient visual stimuli, detecting uh, some measure of the sound like the fundamental frequency or the length, and then detecting things like uh, touch, like uh, for example in the mouse it has touch sensor which it can use to, to detect whether it's um, grasping something. And so um, this set of motor primitives and this set of sensory primitives basically define um, a space of sensory motor contingencies which are basically contingencies between, for example, using certain kinds of actions here or combinations of actions here with certain effects that can be observed. And basically this robot is going to make experiments, which is basically like choosing a particular set of parameters for the actions and try to observe the effects as provided by sensory primitives, and then with this data progressively and incrementally build a model of those sensory motor contingencies which he can then later on reuse to control the world. And so the question is, how does the robot choose which experiment to make at any given moment? So the way it chooses its actions, its experiments, is, is a bit like a, a, a little scientist. So it chooses experiments which it thinks can improve its own predictions, which can provide new information or which makes it progress uh, in learning. And one way to do this in practice is with the following architecture. So it, it is com composed of basically several parts. You have, um, you have one part here, which is basically a very standard um, uh, prediction learning machine, which basically learns to predict the consequences of actions taken by the robot in certain context states. Um, and basically, uh, after doing the prediction, he is doing the action, he is observing the result, he measures the prediction error, and then he updates the model of the sensory motor contingency. And then, on top of this, you have a more um, original module, which is going to monitor the evolution of errors in prediction of this guy, in various parts of the sensory motor space. And those, those various parts of the sensory motor space, which we call here a region, correspond to different kinds of activities of sensory motor um, activities. And so this monitoring is then going to be used that in each region, basically, the, the, um, the, the robot is going to model how much is making improvement in prediction. So basically, the derivative of the prediction errors. And then this derivative, 
is used directly as an intrinsic reward that is then input to an action selection system which goal is basically to try to maximize such intrinsic reward in the future. And so typically how we do that is using bounded techniques which basically mean that the robot is going to sample uh, sensory motor experiments in, va in various kinds of activities or in various parts of the space and then uh, progressively uh, sample more in the parts where it is experiences more learning progress. But yet, because it is in, uh, an, uh, by definition a non-stationary bonded problems, it needs to keep exploring a little bit other parts of the regions and uh, so that at, at the point where in a given region it doesn't make any more progress, it can shift to another kind of sensory motor exploration. Uh, and also because the sensory motor flow does not come initially um, pre-segmented into uh, well-organized different activity, here there is an additional mechanism which is incrementally categorizing the sensory motor space into different kinds of activities. So I won't go into the detail of these mechanisms, but one of the mechanisms that can be used is trying to build categories which differentiate uh, sensory motor experiments uh, or zones in the space of sensory motor experiments with maximal difference in terms of uh, learnability or learning progress. So basically such a mechanism can automatically self-organize explore exploration. So to visualize, to visualize how it is possible, let us first imagine an abstract situation where the robot is confronted with four sensory motor activities and each of the activities has a different kinds of relationship between the body, the learning system and, and, the, and the external physical world such that if the robot would for example spend all its time uh, in activity 2, the, the green one, then the learning profile, for example the evolution of its prediction error would be like this. In activity 1 it would be very bad at the beginning and it would remain pretty bad. In activity 4 it would be very good very at right from the start and remain very good. And activity 3 would be pretty, high, pretty bad at the beginning and then improve pretty fast and then reach a plateau. And so it means that if you use the architecture I just presented, which basically means uh, uh, leads the robot to explore at any given point in time more the activities where there is uh, the highest learning progress, then it means that after sampling a little bit uh, all the alternatives, the robot shall spend more time initially on activity 3 and then when it is reaching this plateau and the activity 2 is providing more learning progress, shift to activity 2 while the other activities are equally uninteresting because they are not providing learning progress. So of course here the activities uh, they are pre-segmented and we see in advance their learning profile. But the architecture I described before does not assume this. The architecture is at the same time as, as trying to go where uh, you have these progress niches, is sampling also the environment to know where, what are the learning profiles of, the sensory act, sensor, sen of these uh, sensory motor activities. And so this is a complicated problem and this is why you need algorithms like bandits. So in the playground experiments, which uh, now we come back to, we uh, made multiple experimental runs which, which led to two general categories of results. A first category of results corresponds to the self-organization of developmental stages and the second category of results corresponds to a mixture of regularities and diversities in the developmental pattern. So thus let's look at the first category of results while, so just here it, you, on the video you can observe the kind of uh, of movements and reaction of the environment, but in this video you, you won't see a lot of organization uh, when you look at it because really here what we are looking at is statistical tendencies in the behavior over a long time span. So like the, the, the kind of organization we look at is not something you can observe in a, in a few minutes, it is really something that is uh, observed only uh, over a few hours. And so if you observe over a few hours, then what you observe is really the self-organization of structured developmental trajectories <laughs> where the robot explores objects and action in a progressively more complex uh, stage-like manner. So typically what's observed is that in the first phase the robot achieves basically unorganized body bubbling, trying to sample different kinds of actions and trying to observe different kinds of effects. And then in the second phase, 
uh, after learning this first rough model and meta model about the evolution of, of learning profile, the robot stops combining motor primitives. He explores them one by one. Uh, but if you look in detail, each primitive is really explored uh, at this stage really in a random manner. And this is only in a third phase that you see the robots uh, beginning to experiment with ac certain kinds of ac with actions in general towards uh, zones of its environment where we know as an external observer there are uh, what we call objects that respond uh, uh, to their actions. So the, the robot does not have the concept of an object, but we can observe and as, and as an external observer that the robot is doing actions toward them. But at this point, the robot is doing them in a non-affordant manner, which is basically it's vocalizing at the, for example, the non-responding uh, elephant ear, and it's trying to bash or to, to, to this robot, which is too far away to be bashed. And then it is only at the fourth phase that the robot now focuses on exploring uh, affordant experiments where it's only using certain kinds of actions uh, toward certain kinds of objects. And so typically, for example, he first explores uh, how to move this object with its leg while looking at it. Then after it, he abandons and he, he, he tries more to, uh, what a timing, <laughs> uh, to explore this, um, uh, how he can grasp with its mouth this kind of object. And finally, he explores how its vocalization can uh, uh, make the other robot respond. And so basically, in the end, this robot has learned sensory motor affordances with several objects, as well as some very basic forms of social affordances with a peer, like he knows that producing certain kinds of vocalization produce certain kinds of effect in, in, in some special object here. And basically, he masters multiple skills, but none of these specific skills were pre-programmed as uh, through a specific reward function by the engineer. They are all the side effect of this general uh, uh, function for exploring driven by learning progress. And basically, they self-organize through the interaction, the dynamic interaction between this curiosity-driven learning exploration, the biases of the statistical inference mechanism, the properties of the body, and the properties of the environment. Because indeed, uh, the relation between the statistical inference mechanism, the properties of the bodies, and the properties of the environment define different profiles of learning progress for different activities. And if you change any of them, for example, you change the properties of the bodies, but you, 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 you keep the, the whole rest the same, then the profiles will be different and you will see different stages <coughs> appear um, uh, in time. And so what's interesting is that this playground experiment do not simply simulate uh, the acquisition of particular skills, but more interestingly, they simulate an ordered and systematic developmental trajectory um, with a stage-like structure, which may be mis mistakenly taken to indi indicate some kind of internal um, maturational process. Here, it is really a developmental structure which is emergent out of the, the dynamic uh, interaction between the, those components. Um, and then a second family of results, of, of, of ways of analy analyzing that, is uh, the duality between regularities and diversity. Which means that if you run those kinds of experiments many times, what you are going to observe is that those stages that I describe, they will appear most most often in this particular order, but still if you look at the detail, you won't see any two robot runs who produce exactly the same developmental trajectory. And sometimes you will see significant differences, like for example, uh, stages which are inverted or stages which do not appear. And sometimes, actually quite rarely, but it exists, developmental trajectories which are very, very different. And Yet, it is all with the same mechanism, with the same initial parameters. Um, and the reason for this is mainly due to stochasticity, which is basically that um, even small variability in the physical realities um, and, and, to the f and, and, and to the fact that this stochasticity is associated to a developmental dynamics. So I just said that the result is the interaction between like, the mechanism of curiosity, learning, the body and the environment. So this is a dynamical system. And it basically has several kinds of attractors with more or less uh, extended and, and strong domain of attraction, which are basically characterized here by the amplitude of learning progress that can be generated. 
And, and so basically, we can take the image of Waddington trying to, that, that he developed for more the embryogenesis, but we could also apply to cognitive development, where the properties of the interaction between the, the brain, the body, and the environment define a potential, uh, pot, pot, what various potentialities uh, for the development of trajectories, and then little variations can make that at some point the d one developmental tra trajectory happens very often, another one absent happens rarely, but still is existing. So a further result here is that the early development of uh, vocal interaction is observed. So with really the, a single generic mechanism, the robot explores and learns how to manipulate objects and how to vocalize to trigger specific responses from uh, a social peer. So while vocal babbling and language games uh, or language play in general have been shown in other work to be very key in infant language development, um, the very interest of infants to engage in babbling and in such actually also more complicated language games is often associated to ad hoc language specific uh, motivational system, which may be true by the way. But here we can see that this is not the only possible hypothesis, that you might have other forms of mechanisms, such as this kind of uh, general exploration mechanisms, which can lead an organism to discover that its vocal, the, the vocal sound that it can produce, can produce effects in some specific objects who happen to be social peers, and it might come to discover that through a mechanism which is really very similar to the way it discovers how with movements of its body, it can produce effects on physical objects. Um, and so, as I just said, curiosity may play an important role in the bootstrapping of, of language and speech in particular. And um, um, uh, relatedly, the social environment also is key in providing guidance for learning and, and exploration. And so here is another model uh, that has explored more specifically how social guidance provided by social peers can be leveraged by a curiosity-driven learning system and interact with it to, to structure the development of, uh, of uh, the, to structure developmental trajectories. And so here it's really in the context of modeling the development of infant vocalizations in the first six months of life. Um, so very early, early on, infants, they play with their vocal tracts. Really, it appears they play with it like they play with their arms and with their hands, like, like they discover a new like some kinds of musical instruments. So they, they also play alone when no one is around and much before they can understand the linguistic role actually of speech sounds. And there are researchers like for example David Oller uh, who've been showing that they are actually exploring a wide diversity of non-linguistic sounds in their first few months uh, before canonical babbling and that there is a lot of structuration in this vocal exploration. And so we conducted experiments uh, where Basically, a robot is exploring the control of, of a, a, model, a physical model of the vocal tract in interaction with vocal peers, uh, which basically are uh, other agents producing uh, only specific kinds of sounds. And here, driven again by the maximization of learning progress. So here we have a, model of the f a physical model of the vocal tract, a model of the ear, a model of the motor control. Uh, and so a, a little difference with the playground experiment is that here the learner can either explore speech sounds on its own or decide to try to <laughs> imitate the speech sounds it hears from the peers around. And the mechanism to decide whether it explores on its own or it tries to imitate the speech sound around is based again on the same idea. It chooses basically the, which option to take, uh, which learning strategy to take based on which one is providing maximal learning progress. And so here again, uh, we observe some form of self-organization of uh, a structure in the exploration. So within an initial phase of self-exploration, uh, we first obs observe the learner discovering how to control phonation, like sound versus non-sounds. Most of the movements of the vocal tract are not producing sounds actually. Then focusing on vocal variations of unarticulated sounds. And then finally automatically discovering uh, on kinds of sound that we, we would call articulated and that would match with the first uh, elements of what we call canonical babbling. And also initially here the learner spends quite little time trying to imitate the sounds of the social peer because initially they are too complicated for him. He does not have the necessary building block to make progress in these sounds. But as the vocal learner becomes more proficient at produce co producing complex sounds, uh, 
imitating the vocalizations of the peer starts to provide to provide learning progress and explains the automatic shift from self-exploration to vocal imitation. And basically, these sequences is exactly the sequence that we observe uh, in the first six months of uh, infant vocal development. Um, so I will skip that very quickly, but just a note. So I, in this talk, I'm not talking at all about the efficiently, <laughs> the efficiency for learning of such mechanisms. Uh, I think Manuel will talk about that tomorrow. But just to note that uh, uh, those models, they, by the way, are extremely efficient to drive uh, robots to explore and learn efficiently motor skills in pretty high dimensions. So for example here, how to locomote in all directions in a 24 dimensional continuous space in just a few hours. Um, so the developmental pattern in the playground experiment, they exhibit a form of, of behavioral and cognitive uh, epigenesis, epigenesis. And in this model, those structures, they are, we cannot say that they are learned from tabula rasa, there is a starter kit, but we cannot say either that they are predetermined, they are not res the result of an innate program. They really form out of this dynamic interaction between constrained cognitive mechanisms, including curiosity, learning biases, abstractions, with the morphological properties of the body, with the physical and social environment. Um, uh, that is actually itself being constrained and ordered by the developmental level of the organism. And so this self-organization uh, really features the dynamic and automatic formation of, of behavioral and cognitive stages. I didn't talk about what the representation that those robots build, but actually there, there are uh, an also an increase in complexity, uh, which, uh, which indeed shares those qualitative properties with infant development. And in a way, these mo models, they can be seen as instantiating the, the intuitive idea put forward by a number of psychologists like Esther Tellen uh, about uh, conceptualizing development as a dynamical system. And here we can here like, uh, manipulate these ideas concretely with those experiments. And um, they might have a number of implications uh, for uh, the development and evolution further than what I already explained. So, in particular, the structure that emerge, they constitute a form, a reservoir of behavioral and cognitive innovations, which you can imagine can be later on recruited for functions that are not yet anticipated, both at the developmental and at the evolutionary level, which correspond to what Stephen Jay Gould has been calling exaptation. Um, so the results here show, for example, that the modality independent generic, me generic mechanisms for curiosity driven exploration of the body and its interactions can lead to the emergence of basic speech skills, basic vocal interaction, basic vocal imi imitation. And so this suggests that in principle, the infants may develop the very first steps of speech cap capabilities without an innate specific bias for learning speech and linguistic uh, interaction, and without a teleological knowledge that such a skill will be recruited later on for the onset of language. And second, uh, such mechanisms, they can also be related to some uh, recent models of the formation and evolution of shared vocalization systems in a population of individuals. In such model, basically, it's been shown that when you have vocal learners which are equipped with mechanisms of <laughs> spontaneous vocal self-exploration, and at the same time, progressively tune their vocalization to match those of their, of their neighbors, then at the level of population, you have some kind of self-organization of, of, of a conventionalized uh, sound system where individuals begin to use all the same sounds um, uh, from each other, but then different in different groups of individuals. And in these models, basically, the mechanisms for systematic babbling, they are ad hoc, they are really hand-programmed. Like they are, they are there and, and, and we don't really explain our, our, our model where they come from. Um, and here we have shown that in a robotic experiment that a principled and modality independent mechanisms for this uh, curiosity driven exploration can drive the learner to explore its vocal, tri its vocal tract, like explore the movements of its arm and then drive it to imitate the vocalization of its social spheres. And so if you combine these families of models, you get to an hypothesis, which is uh, 
uh, bold hypothesis, but I think it is interesting to consider, which is basically that the interaction of individuals intrinsically motivated to learn about their body and their voc vocal tract in particular. Um, and basically, um, uh, trying also, also interesting to learn how those vocal sounds can produce effects on objects and social peers, how it can self-organize shared and conventional vocalization systems at the group level. So basically, you put together many curiosity-driven learners exploring the physical world and the social world, and they might generate spontaneously a shared uh, vocal structure at the population level. And so it raises, I will finish by this, uh, an interesting issue when you try to compare what's happening in humans where, uh, with respect to other animals. So as I argued earlier, uh, motivational mechanisms of curiosity interact strongly, should interact or do interact strongly with other motivational mechanisms like food uh, or the search for mates. And the weight of curiosity with regard to these other motivational systems may vary actually across species. Uh, across at least those that, that would be equipped by such uh, mechanisms of curiosity. And basically the high degree of competition for survival in many species can be naturally expected to promote the avoidance of risk, uh, where you have aversive motivational systems who can overcome very strongly the expression of curiosity. But then, uh, in humans, the multimodal systematicity, systematicity and the extent to which uh, open-ended free play and curiosity is expressed um, might be understood as um, having um, uh, a much bigger role because human infants live uh, in a highly protected environment for a very long period. And so for a quite long period, they, 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 they might have this ability to express this drive for curiosity um, as opposed to these other motivations. And so it leads to the um, hypothesis that maybe one of the, make of, of the causal mechanisms that might explain uh, differences in the development of uh, uh, human beings with other animals might be the, 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 the weight of this curiosity-driven uh, learning mechanism. But really, this remains an entirely open question. I just mentioned it as a, some kind of thing to discuss. Uh, and, and also points to an important research challenge to extend the kind of model I presented, which is really that here the models they focused on the self-organization of developmental structure produced by a single motivational mechanism. So here it was a form of curiosity. But it's really important to understand how the coupling of this with other forms of motivation and possibly aversive motivational system can play on the structuration of the developmental trajectory. So yes, I will stop here. Thank you. I was wondering, is there, is there any direct experimental evidence for, this, for the learning progress idea? I mean, it's been around for a while in different forms, but I don't know, like, behavioral or neural. So basically, th this is what we are working on. We, with Jacqueline, we've been struggling with uh, trying to invent many kinds of paradigms. This is one, one, also why I asked the question to, um, uh, in, the, in, the last, in the last talk. So, I do not think there are very strong evidence for this. I think now we have good ideas of, uh, about experiments that in principle would allow to show that, but I guess there would not be ethical to do that with, uh, with human babies, because actually to, to, to verify this kind of, the, the kind of mechanisms that I describe here are mechanisms that you can really observe on the long term. You don't think there's, there, learning progress plays any role in, in short-term learning, like uh, a short experiment? It could be, but I think it's, um, um, the, uh, to me, the most clear effect would be on the long term. Um, on the short term, we have, for example, the kind of experiment we have been designing, but it's like we don't have definitive results, is you put uh, a human within a completely new sensory motor space. Uh, so what the kind of thing we do is we put people in front of a TV and there is a 3D camera, they move around with their body and it produces uh, changes in abstract visual shape on the TV. And we control the complexity of the mathematical relationship. 
number of degrees of freedom, non-linearities, etc. And so we have several of these, of these new sensory motor spaces, three or four, and we vary the complexity and we try to vary this complexity such that the learning profile will be different when you explore those different uh, sensory motor spaces. And so then the idea is really to study uh, what is the, structur the structure of their exploration of these spaces and can we predict it based, for example, of measure of how much they are improving in each of them. But then there are a number of practical issues that we did not solve entirely. And so I would say that to me the uh, a very big challenge today, which is mo one of the most important one, is to really to, tr to, f to manage to find experimental paradigms that can directly address this. Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking, I, maybe, it's, maybe this is very naive and simplistic, but I, I was just thinking that if, if learning progress is basically tracking the derivative of prediction errors in some capacity, right, then you should be able to design experiments where you have, you ha in different conditions, you have the same, in some local, sort of locally the same prediction errors, but different uh, derivatives. <coughs> yeah, this is what we, uh, yeah. Okay, so, right. But, but that would be even a short, that would be actually yeah, yeah, a no, no. short time. Yeah, I, no, I, I agree, I agree. So, so th this is what we are trying to do right now, because we don't know how to do the long-term <laughs> studies. Yeah. So we are, in practice, trying to do this one. Okay. Yes. Cool. So I have also a question uh, concerning this learning progress measure based on prediction error um, or on this derivative of the prediction error. One problem with the prediction error can be that you can actually design the action so that, for example, the, the sensory inputs become very easily predictable. So for example, you go into a dark, in, into a dark hall of the room and it's very easily predictable what uh, what your sensory input will be, but it's not not it's not very informative in a way too. So, did you uh, run into problems? Well, the learning progress idea is is precisely meant to address this problem. No, but I mean, you could still you could design. You can f first have a big prediction error in in, in uh, your visual input, but then you direct yourself uh, basically into a dark part of the room. <laughs> yeah, but and there the prediction error gets small. So yeah, so but but. Yeah, so, so actually then if you do that you are comparing things which are actually different kinds of sensory motor activities. And so this is why... So okay, so you want a positive derivative, not a negative derivative? <laughs> oh, no, 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 you want, you want it to become small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's why we have this categorization system. We try... So, so by the categorization system you get around that? Yes. Okay. Uh, those on in the back? Um, yeah. Did your um, uh, the playground uh, playground experiments um, <coughs> did the model have a cost for switching? Um, no, but this is indeed a, I, I an interesting question. Yes. Because I was like, we've, we've been, I have some like, we should talk later also, but the, um, I've been working on doing some just formal to display point uh, models mm. of attention. I mean, kids to explain alternative accounts of ADHD. Um, and it, that, that might add some, some yeah. dynamics to the yeah. current setup. So. so, so you don't get stuck in, in loops where they're switching back and forth. If you have certain, if you have certain, um, if how much to learn is not a linear function, do you get in situations where there's rapid switching back and forth between them? Because as you as you as you get close to learning, all the yeah. So in in yeah. So typically, what you can get is two different kinds of activities, which are providing equivalent learning progress. And so indeed, in that situation, you will uh, have the system explore both. Um, and to complement uh, this, actually, with this, if you consider just this kind of mechanisms of exploration driven by, by uh, learning progress, you will actually indeed come into problems when you are exploring large spaces. And this is exactly why uh, uh, we are now studying the interaction of such mechanism with other forms of constraints, uh, such as maturation, such as social guidance, um, such as abstraction. So for example, in other models, actually in one of the models, but I didn't explain that, in the model where you have the speech development, it's a bit different than the playground experiment in the sense that here, the measure of interestingness does not apply to motor commands or actions to, to, to do and then you observe the result. The measure of interestingness applies to goals, which are in this context auditory goals. 
But in other contexts, it could be, for example, so you are exploring how your like the relation between your arm movements and how it can produce movements on an object. Here, a goal is a change in the configuration of the object. And so here, basically, you are going to drive your exploration by choosing the kind of effect you would like to produce. And, you're going and, and basically, it's the same idea. An interesting effect is one for which you are making a progress in competence. But actually, if you look uh, at big sensory motor spaces, doing that is going to be significantly more efficient than uh, doing it in the simple way I described uh, here. <coughs> I'm trying to choose my question to use one just. Um, I, I'd like you to elaborate a little bit on your comparison between acceptation in, in evolution and uh, the ontogenetic progress. I, I'm not sure whether you meant just as a metaphor that um, the progress within ontogeny could actually co-opt knowledge acquired for one motivational system to be used in another, which is not, not very problematic, or uh, and, and you compare it with Gould's idea about acceptation, or whether you think really that you go beyond that and that you, you, you think there is some uh, identity of the concept. Uh, no, I, th I, th I think there is some part of, well, it is a speculation, okay? Uh, yeah. But my speculation is that there is some uh, identity of the concept in the sense that um, the like mechanisms for spontaneous exploration, its evolutionary origins can be explained independently of language. Um, it, ca it can be very useful for organisms to spontaneously explore their environment, to forage for information, to, okay, when there is a problem, they already know how to solve it. Um, and then what I'm, I, what I'm saying is that um, if, if, if then you develop a system that pr basically does that in a systematic manner across all modalities, the organism will come to explore how to produce vocal, vocal speech sounds and then to, to develop um, a repertoire of organized speech sounds. And then, if somewhere else uh, in the evolutionary process you have something which is trying to... to uh, you have a process of selection of, of mechanisms for communication, then those, those speech structures which emerge as a side effect of these mechanisms of curiosity, then they are already there. You can, it can be recruited as a building block for uh, um, constructing the communication. So when you need to develop a communicative structure, you need signals that are uh, differentiable, that are adaptive, uh, especially, in, well, I'm speaking about the human language. And so here, the, you, you would already have a, a material in, 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 the ma in the matter of those signals that can, that, like, you don't need to evolve them in the context of language, they are already there. How is that conceptually different from, say, a bird that comes out of, it's a tetrapod, it has evolved from organisms that develop four legs to walk, and when it's going to evolve flying, it's going to use whatever is there before, mm -hmm. like the, the and then a, a, a bat will use something else, which is there before mm -hmm. flying. Mm -hmm. Do you call all of these acceptations? If, if you no, but no, no, actually I, I would, always build yeah, 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 already. no, actually, yes. Um, um, I, I, here I use the word exaptation in the sense, I think again of Gould, that here like the speech structure would emerge uh, without being functional. It's more a side effect, an architectural side effect. Um, and then this architectural side effect of something else that was functional, but this, I mean it's like you have the lamps, they are made for light, but until recently they all produce heat. Yeah. And, 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 and so this heat is, was not functional, actually it was dysfunctional. But you, you, you can reuse it to heat after, after, after you get this object. In my example, the, the four legs of a reptile are usable, but not usable for flying. So from the point of view of flying, you could call it an acceptation. Yes. But actually, it was all the way an adaptive course of change. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I'm not sure, you see the, the logic of that research program is that you should be looking for things that have no explanation, no adaptive value. And you will never be able to show that, that something no, no. doesn't exist. No, no, I, I agree. So, so okay, so, I know, an, so an, another way to formulate my answer is that uh, I don't care whether it's useful or not to call that exaptation. 
what I what I care is that here we have an example of uh, 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 an object which is speech structure. We would like to understand what are the mechanisms that can generate it, and we can see that those mechanisms they are probably very similar to the mechanism that allow the organisms to learn how to locomote, which I think is quite helpful to understand the, the evolutionary steps that were needed to get there. So now, indeed, whether you call that exaptation or not, okay, that's less important. Take one last question, and then we can have coffee break. Uh, so I was just wondering whether you thought about this learning progress issue also in terms of learning any particular skill you can imagine having different hypothesis structures about what the best way that, what, what is the best description of, of the task or the state space or something, uh, in sort of like a mixture of experts kind of way. And then whether, um, is there an analogy there where, they, where you can use learning progress to determine which of these experts actually use, or is used for that one? Yeah, so actually there, there is something that with Manuel we, we are developing is the concept of strategic learning, which is when you you need to, 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 to solve a number of tasks, multiple tasks, and uh, you have uh, multiple but limited resources to do that. And those resources, they can be uh, not only limited time, but various learning strategies, various representational languages to, to try to represent the problem, various sources of information. So for example, you could have uh, various social peers, various teachers, they might not all be equal. And so the question is, how do you strategically organize uh, uh, your learning in terms of which are the choices, which teacher you ask to, which representation you are going to use, which learning, uh, uh, inf which statistical inference mechanism are you going to use? And the kind of idea we are trying to pursue is that we could use this learning progress idea to do that in a, a bit of a hierarchical manner. All right, thank you very much.